Good evening, everyone. I hope you all had um, a good Thanksgiving break. Um, I hope you were able to spend some time off um, safely, whatever that looked like. I'm sure it looked a little bit different for everybody. Um, but thanks. And, and I also hope that you enjoyed the snow um, this past week and that it wasn't too much of a hassle for, for anybody. Um, good to see you all. So today we're going to hear from the Department of Permits, License and Inspections first. Then we're going to take a little break and then we'll hear from the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh. And the title of this session today is Housing and Quality of Life. Um, I would say PLI sort of falls a little bit more on our quality of life um, side of that. Um, and Housing Authority obviously goes with housing, um, but they, they do kind of intertwine in a way um, that I think you'll see throughout the presentation. Um, so we'll start out with Director Sarah Kinter from our Department of Permits, License and Inspections. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Hey, happy to be here. Sorry to interrupt. Um, just a reminder, everyone, if you have, uh, let's hold questions till the end. And if you have a question um, to raise your hand um, through Zoom and I'll call on you and we can facilitate those questions after the director's presentation. Sure, uh, also if folks wanna put them in chat as we go, um, that we can get to them in the end or as, as I see them, um, that, that'd be helpful too. Well, first, thanks for being part of the Civic Leadership Academy. It's a really wonderful program, and I appreciate the time that you guys have dedicated to learning about how city government works. It's pretty cool. Uh, my name is Sarah Kinter. I'm the director of the Department of Permits, Licenses, and Inspections. And the mission of PLI is to ensure safety in the built environment. So that is our mission within the jurisdiction of Pittsburgh. Um, we're empowered to carry out this mission through the enforcement of the building code, zoning code, licensing codes adopted into Pittsburgh city code. So we carry out the mission to ensure that there's a built environment um, or to carry that out relies on having a robust permitting operation so that construction within the city bounds meets those minimum construction code requirements and a robust operations enforcement division to issue citations and get compliance. So our permitting, licensing, code enforcement, and inspection powers are reflected in Pittsburgh City Code in a few titles that are listed here. Title 10 uh, codes are what we refer to when we issue building permits and violations related to permitting or lack thereof. Um, and it also includes some property maintenance standards. Title IX is the zoning code, Title VII the licensing code, and then there are some pieces in Title VI that we'll talk about that have to do with property maintenance that PLI enforces. So pretty wide breadth of enforcement regulations within the, within the code are within PL, PLI's jurisdiction. I think it's helpful to understand where these rules come from and what they do for our communities. So on the building code side, there's an international body called the International Code Council or ICC, and they come out with updated model codes every three years. And then the state of Pennsylvania adopts a version of those codes with some minor changes. And that's what's called the Uniform Construction Code. So you can kind of see that with the arrows here. In October 1, 2018, Pennsylvania adopted the 2015 versions of the ICC code. Um, so that's the, the year that we're on. So ICC is working on 2021 versions of the code, state of Pennsylvania, we're at 2015, and that's what's been adopted uh, at Pittsburgh city code level. So that's what we're enforcing when we talk about the codes in our department. And I think it's also important to note that these are minimum standards of safety that are concerned with life safety systems of a structure. So I'll give some examples. The codes provide standards for means of egress. Can people appropriately exit the structure in the event of a fire? The codes provide standards for fire ratings uh, of walls. How do we ensure that the structure lasts long enough in a fire for folks to get out? Um, it looks at the use of a space and the type of structure to dictate whether a fire alarm or a fire suppression system is required. 
Um, you know, questions such as does access to common areas or the accessible path meet accessibility building code uh, requirements for persons with disabilities? Is there proper ventilation? Does the cooking hood for the restaurant meet the mechanical standards to ensure safety in case of a fire? Um, is the foundation stable and suitable for the type of rock soil sediment of a region um, or on a location of a steep slope or a location that's undermined? Um, does the structure meet the wind and snow load uh, requirements that are appropriate for our climate in Pennsylvania? These are the types of issues and considerations that are covered in these safety codes and enforced through the department to ensure safety of the structure um, for our environmental health and the health of the built environment. And permitting is that process to enforce those requirements and to ensure that construction meets those codes. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that process too. So on uh, that's that's the codes, or those are the, the codes that you see here where it says IBC, IEBC, um, you know, the International Fuel Gas Code. That's what we are enforcing on our permitting side. On the code enforcement side or operations side, the city has directly adopted codes related to the built environment that PLI enforces. So those are not state mandates, those are local mandates. And that would include the 2015 International Property Maintenance Code, uh, the zoning code, which is reviewed and approved by our sister department of city planning and enforced through the permitting and citation processes of PLI. And other quality of life provisions in city codes, such, such as keeping your grass or lawn maintained in area free of debris and garbage. Um, also something that PLI would inspect for and enforce. From a, um, an applicant or a customer perspective, this is a little bit what the construction process looks like or should look like. This is a very simplified life cycle of a permit. Um, you know, permit first, then build should be the, the process here. Um, you know, first you're, you're looking to do some type of work, maybe a new deck, a garage, an addition, skyscraper. Um, where their structural work construction drawings are to be submitted to PLI and we review to ensure that they're in compliance with the codes. The drawings are required under state law and under our codes to be stamped by a PA licensed architect or engineer. And I think it's important to note that PLI does not provide code advice. We don't create drawings. We review drawings that are submitted to ensure that they meet those code standards. So it's important for owners to have relationships with design professionals through this process. Um, there, are, there are types of scopes of work that don't require drawings. Um, so those would be your normal minor alterations, uh, which ordinarily include repairs. So if you have to patch your roof, you don't need drawings for that. But if you're reconfiguring space, if you're changing the use, knocking down structural walls, you have to work with a design professional. Once the drawings are approved, uh, a license holder may have to be selected. Um, this, it, a license holder is required for uh, commercial uh, buildings. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about license holders in a, in a few slides. Um, but if you're working on your own primary residence, uh, then you do not need a license. So I think that's important for homeowners to know. Um, and if you're, I should say, if you're working on your own primary residence and you're doing a minor alteration, uh, then you do not need a, a license holder to pull that permit. Once you have a permit in hand, construction can begin. And our PLI inspectors inspect along the way to ensure that the permit meets the drawings that were submitted and approved or the standards of the code. If it's a minor alteration, then there are no drawings. And once inspections are passed and work is completed property, that permit is closed out and done. It's also a good time to talk about work scopes that don't require a permit. So not everything requires a permit. Um, here you'll see some examples and we have a, a web page here. I will share this uh, PowerPoint um, with the folks from uh, Community Affairs so they can provide this information to you guys. Um, but you know, for example, if you were to go to Home Depot and get a shed that's a less than 120 square foot, put it in your backyard, um, it's not something that would require a PLI permit. Fences that are less than six feet high um, structurally don't require a permit, but I will point out that you do require a zoning review. So there is a zoning and development review application with our sister department, um, and you would have to apply for that. 
Um, what they're going to look like look at is uh, setbacks, lot lines, ensuring that um, you're meeting the zoning requirements um, of putting up a fence or, or um, putting a shed together. So um, another common question we have is like finishing work. You now, if I wanted to change the tiles or papering or painting, those things would not require a permit through PLI. So some, some tips for homeowners, um, like I had said previously, if you're doing structural work, hire a design professional. Um, again, PLI has requirements for those drawings, but in addition, they will guide you through the process. Um, PLI has a ton of tools and resources to research your home before you buy it. And we're gonna talk about some of those tools um, later in the slide. Um, and there's also ways for you to track your permit. So when you do engage in, in the process, if you are the applicant uh, through our online portal, um, there's a way to track the information. But even if you're not an applicant, you can get a lot of information online about what's happening um, with your permit. So we're gonna talk a lot about that. So from a staff perspective, um, and because this has been the hot topic, I thought it would be helpful um, to talk a little bit about um, our operations during the pandemic. And PLI's operations through the pandemic highlight our important public safety role that we play and the public services that we provide for Pittsburgh. So you may recall in March of 2020, Governor Wolf had issued an order to shut down construction statewide during what was known as the red phase um, of the pandemic. And during the red phase of the governor's order, PLI enforced the statewide construction halt locally uh, and continued to review, issue, and inspect permits for emergency work, work related to healthcare facilities, and then work that received state waivers until May 8th. Uh, when that order was lifted and construction work resumed full force. Each cog of our permit machine was crucial to our mission and operations. So during the red phase, um, we have a um, staff group called application technicians. Um, they receive certifications in uh, permit uh, intake. Um, and they screened for emergency permits and continued to intake all other permits, ensuring that they were in the proper queue. Application technicians also issued minor alteration emergency permits same day. So if someone had a leaky roof during the shutdown, Aptex got those out the door, often same day or next day. For permits with structural reviews, those move down the line to our plans examiners. Those are architects or engineers that we have on staff that review construction drawings and ensure that they meet code, just so we talked about. Um, they also prioritized emergency permit reviews while working remotely, um, but also continued to review electronic submissions in the standard queue. Our inspectors out in the field played a very crucial role in enforcing the order to halt construction. And importantly, they inspected in progress permits to ensure site stability and safety before closing those sites down. And of course, also attended to emergency and healthcare permit sites. Um, we also needed to issue violations and get those notices to owners immediately to address life safety violations. And that relied on having our clerical staff come into the office run the batches of violations and get them out the door. On our operations code enforcement side, our fire and life safety inspectors continue to inspect for high occupancy structures, uh, or to, excuse me, to inspect high occupancy structures for fire life safety systems. And our vacant property inspectors continue to respond to condemned, vacant, abandoned building complaints that we receive through 311. Um, again, needed that clerical staff to get those violations out the door. Despite the courts being closed, emergencies were still being um, dealt with in the court system. Um, and our, our staff was key in, in getting those through. This is our organizational chart and sort of gives you a view of, of our staff as it, as it currently is. Um, so we have 89 employees shown here, um, but truly PLI is, is a pretty lean department. Um, our positions work in sequence and in support of our mission, um, and all of our construction and administrative divisions worked full-time through the shutdown, um, shown in the blue and the green. 
And then in the red, you're seeing that operations side. Those are the folks that are answering um, 311s for violations for the zoning code um, and for the international property maintenance code. Um, those fire and life safety maintenance inspection requirements. Um, and just to pause on that, what that is, is there are high occupancy buildings within the city of Pittsburgh um, where we have to ensure that their fire and life safety systems work. Schools, nursing homes, high rises, right? Places where a lot of people are gathered, they need to get out the door. We need to make sure that those systems are properly maintained and tested annually um, for their safety. So that's what those folks are doing. And those can, that type of inspection continued um, through the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. We also perform emergency demolitions of uh, eminently dangerous structures, also something we had to continue doing through the pandemic. So during the lockdown, our changes to operations included halting all non-emergency property maintenance inspections while the courts were closed um, for everything that wasn't an emergency until June 10th. Um, we closed our physical customer service counter down and we adopted inter internal and external policies to ensure safety of PLI staff. So we issued COVID-19 guidance that required appropriate safety measures at job sites. We outlined rules for conducting safe inspections um, and we empowered our inspectors to fail inspections and issue stop work orders where COVID-19 compliance was not met. Uh, inspectors are a shared resource. We only have so many of them for all the wards in the city of Pittsburgh, and it's important that we keep them safe and at full capacity. And I have to say for all of our divisions, I'm really pr proud of PLI's work and our ability to be nimble and adapting to change um, and continuing to operate. Our technology investments enabled us to work effectively and efficiently through the pandemic. So at the forefront is our one-stop PGH, PGH platform, uh, which is our one-stop shop for all development applications. And it is a platform that inclu includes the Department of Permits, Licenses, and Inspections, the Department of City Planning, Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, and the Fire Bureau permits. So all in one place where you can apply for those types of development related applications. Um, this, was, this project has been going on um, for quite some time. Um, I came into PLI uh, October of 2017 um, and you know the city had gone through a, a contracting phase and an RFP phase. Um, to secure a vendor. And then when I onboarded, I was part of um, configuring licensing for PLI, which uh, went live December of 2018. Uh, then we had our permitting go live, then we had zoning um, come along with us. And just recently this last May, um, our code enforcement team and Domi came online on One Stop um, as well. And One Stop PGH allows customers and staff to continue transparent permit work and interactions remotely. It was key uh, in working through the pandemic. It's a paperless system that uses GIS layers and application field inputs to help streamline the permitting process with technology. Um, and it sounds novel, but this is the first time that all PLI staff are working in the same system. We now can see all of our operations on every parcel in one system. Last year, or in the last year, the number of permits submitted through the online system shot up, obviously, because our physical location has been closed since March. And because of the importance of the one-stop PGH tool, we integrated additional customer service features that included a new chat feature called Talk To, uh, which enables us to help customers along in the online portal. Staff can see what customers are clicking on in the One Stop PGH portal and guide them to make a successful application real time. So the chat feature has been immensely popular. Um, and since it's launched in mid-April, we help about 80 people a day through the chat feature. It was a feature born out of the pandemic and the need to maintain customer service, but it's certainly here to stay. Um, and we've worked with our sister departments to have their staff plug into this feature as well so we can work better together. Another feature that we had adopted um, was a web-based phone application in partnership with our IT department so that we could answer customers safely while working from home. 
Um, took us a while to get that together. It didn't launch until mid-May. Um, but the web-based phone app actually provided additional functionality that our desk phones didn't have in the office. So we were able to do things like transfer calls and have caller ID um, and able to capture stats. Um, so through our online chats, our calls, and our emails, PLI, PLI has over 200 one-stop PGH centered customer service interactions daily. Um, so we have a ton of interactions with um, you know, development work happening um, and you know, citations and enforcement work happening within the city of Pittsburgh every day. Because we only accepted electronic submissions through the pandemic, our plan review benefited um, because we were not dealing with the administrative burden of paper drawing. So if anyone's ever um, you know, worked on a big project or worked with an architect or engineer or a design professional to submit a permit, you know, folks would come to the office with giant rolls of drawings, um, plop them on the counter, um, and we would have to find space for them uh, in our library um, of drawings. Um, so the electronic drawing uh, system allowed us to mark up drawings electronically. Um, you know, one additional important feature of the One Stop PGH platform has been our automated plan review report uh, and markups that list the revisions to obtain approval that you can download as many times as you like from the customer portal. Um, and actually see where the changes need to occur. So, you know, people would submit drawings, you know, with a bunch of sprinkler heads, um, you know, and written text would say change sprinkler head, you know, whatever. Um, here we're able to market this sprinkler head over here doesn't have enough coverage. This one right here, it's very clear um, and a really great um, customer service value added um, to have that clarity in, in our reviews. Um, and we've been working with our sister departments to coordinate our review timelines and approvals for better customer service. So reviews are happening faster. So we've, we've seen our review times improve. Um, we have service level agreements for commercial structures where we say it's going to take 30 business days for an initial review. You can see here, we're doing that on average in 23 days. Um, on the residential side, it's a 15 business day service level agreement. On average, we're doing that in nine business days on the first review. And the second review is even faster. Um, and you know, the other, the other thing to note, we're talking about average, but we are meeting our service level agreements 99% of the time. So our review staff um, is consistent um, and fast um, and providing excellent customer service. On the inspection side, um, for construction, most of our inspection data is related to open permits. Um, in a year time frame, you can see that our construction side has completed over 28,000 inspections, which is about five inspections per day, assuming full staffing. Um, in addition, construction inspectors are performing enforcement inspections to issue citations for work without a permit or working outside the scope of a permit, et cetera. Um, so a lot of stop works in 2020, given the shutdown. There's a few different outcomes of an inspection, including pass, fail, accessible, or partially passed if you have phase work. And we're seeing about an 80% pass rate. And the one highlight of One Stop PGH system is that owners, contractors, and trade license permits holders receive an inspection report that has the checklist of what PLI is inspecting for, that pass or fail determination of that item. We want to be transparent about what we're looking for in the field. Um, and in addition, it helps us enforce the inspection sequence. So customers can request an inspection through the online uh, portal, but you can't request your final inspection until you've passed all those previous inspections to get there. So bigger picture, what does 2020 look like for PLI in terms of permitting and how did the shutdown affect permits in Pittsburgh? In our data from January 1, 2020 through November 15th, we've issued a little over 8,000 permits and project that we'll issue about 900 um, by year's end. So that's a dip of about 13%. And it's important to note that some of that dip 
can be attributed to a change in our business practice since we launched the permits portion of One Stop PGH in May of 2019 in the way that we process amendments in the new system. And that only accounts for about 3%. So, you know, we're still looking at, you know, a, overall a 10% drop in permits um, due to the construction shutdown in 2020. What's interesting though, is despite that permit decrease of 10%, the value of construction side, um, we see a reported $1.1 billion of permitted work occurring in Pittsburgh. And we project that we'll just get right over 1.3 billion mark by year's end. Um, so a little bit of a decrease, 10% decrease in our permits, um, but a little bit of an increase uh, in the, the work that's occurring in the city of Pittsburgh. So despite the pandemic, a strong construction economy. On the operations side, you know, switching gears, inspectors are enforcing the property maintenance code, zoning code, business licensing codes. And this division includes our unit that inspects, again, those fire life safety systems for high occupancy buildings and those vacant property unit that inspects condemned buildings. And in the past year, that whole um, operations unit has completed over 55,000 inspections, which amounts to about eight inspections per inspector at full capacity. When our code enforcement team receives a complaint and conducts an inspection, 65% of the time a violation is issued. And one important feature of the new system has been reporting inspection outcomes and reflecting those in our public portal called Building Eye, which I have a few slides about a little bit later. Now folks know whether the inspector issued the violation or not and why. Um, of course, those inspections that result in a violation um, about over 80% of the time, just over 80%, the violations are corrected and abated, which is fantastic. But if it's not, PLI on its third inspection proceeds to court. And another new feature of the one-stop PGH code enforcement system is recording the court outcomes in Building I as well. So we just started inputting this data June 9th, 2020. Um, and so far we have a little over 2,300 court outcomes. And most of the time, the outcome is that the case is continued. Um, so we're still collect collecting and digging into this data, but we've recorded 900 cases with a final status um, that closed the case. And 28% of the time, that's dismissed with no service. And that means that the courts and PLI couldn't track down a responsible agent to abate violations on the property. And these are by far the cases that take up the most of PLI's time. Um, and they're you know, the nuisance properties that neighbors complain about. One way we're addressing these properties is through our new programmatic inspection tool in One Stop PGH. We use programmatic inspections to list and inspect those high occupancy buildings for fire and life safety, condemned structures, and now for a listing that we call dead end cases. The goal is to track these properties in a separate listing, research them for a responsible agent, and proactively inspect to send them to DPW for board up of the property um, if uh, it's opened up to the elements or to, to people. Um, or to send to the clean and lean team to clean and cut the property. I think it's a good time to emphasize that if you do have a complaint, the best way to contact us is through 311. It feeds directly into the One Stop PGH system and goes right into the inspector's queue that's assigned to that ward. I also like to po uh, point out at this time that inspectors do have limitations. So we need to ensure that we have proper right of entry and don't intrude on anyone's Fourth Amendment rights. PLI may only gain access into a property for four different, uh, in four different ways. Um, one, that access is granted uh, under the jurisdiction of a first responder and limited to a, an emergency incident. So um, PLI gets called out for you know, catastrophic fires, uh, landslides, um, you know, when cars um, run into buildings to ensure that uh, we are taking into account the structural stability of that building and ordering anyone to vacate um, if they're uh, put in the harm's way. Access can be granted by prop the actual property owner or tenant 
Um, the property can be investigated from the public right away or en route to the front door uh, to seek entry and knock. So we can you know, basically go where a mail carrier goes um, or investigated from an adjacent property with access granted by that adjacent property owner. Um, but proper right of entry must be granted to perform inspections. So no peeking over fences, no trying to get into someone's backyard. Um, it's a really serious issue and something um, that we take very seriously in our inspections. Um, and all that to say, you know, sometimes the answer to a complaint is that we weren't able to see uh, the, the violation. So putting contact information is always helpful if you're willing to grant us access um, to see something from an adjacent uh, property. This gives you an overview of the PLI citation process um, and our platform building I Civic Central will, will show these violations that are open. Um, and if you have an account with uh, building I Civic Central, you can see closed violations as well. So here you can see we do uh, three notices uh, before going to court. Um, our, we have service level agreements associated with our inspections as well. So um, you start a complaint, it gets into a PLI inspector's queue. Within three business days, we're gonna go out and inspect. Um, if there's no violation, we close the case. Um, if there is a violation, we send our first notice. Um, we give a compliance period. Uh, it's a range from five to 30 days, depending on the severity of um, the issue. So for example, an extreme electrical uh, fire hazard, you're gonna get a five day violation on that. Sometimes stop works, five day violation. Um, weeds and debris, I believe are 15. Um, there are some zoning code violations that would give you 30. Um, so giving you time um, to apply, uh, maybe go through a process. Uh, we do it again on the second inspection. On the third inspection, that's that 20, uh, you know, that's that percentage um, that we're sending to court. Um, that's in front of the magisterial district judges. That information is now posted on Building I Civic Central for community members to attend court hearings um, and um, you know follow follow cases. Uh, switching gears a little bit, PLI also runs a licensing program to ensure that permits are obtained by contractors and trade license holders who are qualified and are connected to businesses that pay their city taxes and have proper insurances to work in the city of Pittsburgh. Trade license holders must have passed an exam relevant to their trade um, and are qualified to obtain permits for specialized life safety work, including electrical, mechanical, uh, and fire suppression work permits. Trade license holders are required also to obtain annual continuing education. And due to the pandemic, many classes were canceled and licensees had to look for online courses. So in the last year, PLI has extended grace periods for trade license holders and forgave late fees. Um, and we did expect a bit of a decline in license holders due to the pandemic. Um, but overall, we only saw about an 8% decrease in our general contractor licenses and about an average of a 3% decrease in our trade license holders. Um, we do do a smattering of other business licenses as well that have a nexus to public safety work, um, but I left them out of this um, longer presentation today. Um, so oop, last but not least, wanna talk about different resources that are available. Um, first, we created videos to help people navigate through One Stop PGH. So if you have to apply for a permit, or a license um, or um, check an application, use the search feature. Um, we have some videos for folks to follow um, and you know, learn how to get through the process. You do not have to create an account to search One Stop PGH. So highlighted here, uh, if you're looking for information on a, on a permit application and where it's at, you can search One Stop PGH. You can also use Building Eye. Um, both are going to give you uh, about the same information, but it's a it's a great tool um, to search on a parcel or search something. Maybe maybe you have someone who's applying for something on your behalf. You want to see where they are, what they're doing. Um, it's a great place to look. 
This just gives you sort of a snapshot of what it looks like when you are applying online, sort of a menu of permit options. You click on one, fill out the fields, and submit. Other information that we post continuously, uh, one is called, you know, what's the status of my permit? So um, PLI reviews first in, first out. Um, so if you apply for a permit, you know, we have our service level agreements and we'll say we're going to try to get this done within 30 business days or 15 business days. You can actually see using this web page where you are in the queue and who's ahead of you and watch that queue move along. So you can see whether we're faster um, or, you know, taking, we're going to take, you know, that 15 business days. Um, you can track that through this web page where we have an Excel spreadsheet of all the, the permits that are in the review queue. And I also think it, it gives a nice um, overview of the volume. You know, I've talked about, I've had a lot of numbers thrown out there today, but I think the one thing I hope um, you're coming away with is that PLI is doing a really high volume of work, right? We're doing the, you know, 28,000 um, construction inspections and 55,000 operations inspections and 9,000 reviews and 10,000 permits. This year, 8,000 permits. Um, so it's really high volume work, and uh, which is you know, something that uh, we like. Uh, it's something that a lot of you know uh, people in the department um, are geared towards. Um, but I also think it puts in perspective um, the volume and, and how PLI operates. Um, this is just a screenshot of what it looks like if you have a plan review in the queue and if you're looking for your project and you know where you are in the list. So it's you know, first in, first out, um, and uh, just an Excel spreadsheet to give people transparent information about where they are in the queue. And then the best tool of all, um, Building Eye. Building Eye is a place where you can search around a map in your neighborhood, see what building is going on, see um, in the Civic Central side, what code enforcement violations are happening. Um, you know, if there's building going on and you're wondering if they have a permit, here's the place to look. Um, it updates nightly. So if you um, submitted a 311 in the morning uh, and we inspected it the next day, you're probably not going to see that till the next day because of the way that the system updates. So it's not exactly real time, but it does update daily um, at night. just a screenshot of what it looks like. Um, so here, you know, are, there's these circles around a dot and it's showing you, hey, at 414 Grant Street, there was a building permit. Um, there's the description of work. That's the expectation of what they're working on and then where they are in the process. So they have some inspections that are completed, the permit was issued, et cetera. Another great search tool we have um, is our certificates of occupancy search tool. So if you're trying to find out whether a, a structure has a valid certificate of occupancy, you can use this tool on our website um, to do a search. Um, we also are, um, we're actually upgrading this um, with a new reporting tool from our new system, but we uh, expose our list of condemned buildings um, buildings that have received asbestos surveys because we are looking to demolish them um, through our uh, PLI processes for dangerous structures. Um, and, you know, the next steps of that after we had an asbestos survey could be that they were under contract um, and then, you know, buildings that we actually demolished or raised. So that's all information that's available for the public to see um, what PLI has um, demolished in the city of Pittsburgh. And this is just a before and after of a city of Pittsburgh demolition or PLI demolition. Um, this was a, a structure where the brick wall fell down um, almost entirely on that uh, left-hand side. Roof was collapsing. Back of the property was um, structurally imminently dangerous. Um, and that is the after picture. Um, so as part of our contracts, we ensure that there's proper grading and drainage um, and coverage um, of, of the parcel that's uh, had the demolition occur. And that is uh, PLI's function uh, and a lot of our work. Uh, be happy to look at questions. Thank you, Director Kinter. Um, really appreciated that very thorough presentation. Um, 
I don't see any questions in the chat right now. So I think we can just start. It looks like uh, Dan has his hand raised. You want to start us off? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, well, first off, uh, be, before I launch in here to my one question, I'm limiting myself to one, you know, but welcome. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I just want to say, Sarah, I, I do not envy you. I think that you have one of the hardest jobs in the city. I have talked to a lot of people um, working with permits and inspections and so on, and there is not a lot of love out there for PLI. <laughs> um, so, you know, I definitely appreciate that, uh, the, all the work that you folks do over there. Um, my question is, is, is a concern regarding the, um, the plans for the system generated reviews and so on. So or I'm in the process of opening up a coffee shop. As a matter of fact, Councilman Krause had a conversation with you about some permit problems that we had had um, regarding that. Uh, and the challenge that we had come across is that our plans were approved and we were all good to start construction and we did. And then very near the end of the process, um, we were told, oh, wait a minute, we shouldn't have approved those plans stop working. Well, the problem then is that we'd already spent all of our money, we'd already built the space, and so we were kind of in limbo for a little while. So what I'm wondering is, from the result of those conversations, are there new systems being developed to, to avoid those incidences happening where businesses uh, uh, like mine are working with PLI in good faith, but to make sure they don't get kind of caught up in in issues and problems in the process. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, I don't recall your particular um, issue. It's not ringing a bell. Uh, but just to talk sort of generally about some process changes that um, PLI is working from or working on. Um, we are looking uh, to be accredited as a building department agency. And that requires a few different processes. Um, one of those that's very important is auditing. So um, reviewing both reviewer and inspector work to ensure that it's meeting our standards. So behind the scenes, we have checklists, um, both on the reviewer side and on the inspection side. Um, and those should catch the basics of the code, re code requirements. But auditing is a way to ensure that that's happening in a systematic way um, and you know, for us to catch issues. So um, we've started that process um, now that we have a robust reporting feature um, where we're able to do that. Um, and it has been helpful in you know, catching either misconceptions in what a checklist item might mean um, or the enforcement of an inspection item out in the field. So I think that's, you know, one way on a process point for us to, you know, catch an issue that maybe we have missed. Um, and certainly we don't want to play gotcha. We want to be transparent and we want people to know upfront exactly what we're reviewing and inspecting for so that things don't happen at the end of a process. So apologies if that's um, what you're dealing with currently. Uh, we could certainly talk offline about that um, as well. Some other things that we're doing um, include completing permitting rules and regulations. So um, this is a long and boring document, um, but it's about transparency. So. Um, in hopefully spring of 2021, we'll be producing a document that again is about what are PLI's processes, what are our checklists, what are um, what can you expect um, when we issue a violation, um, and in our code enforcement capacity, you know what happens when we issue a stop work. Um, some of those things are in our codes, but some of those things are local um, processes adopted by the department. Um, and so, you know, this is something that we'll be accepting public comments on. Um, and, you know, we'll also help be transparent about PLI's processes. Um, we're also trying to do more to provide better guidance to um, design professionals. Um, so there are, uh, you know, something recently that we did we provided guidance on the differences between the Accessibility Building Code and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and, you know, it's important for design professionals to know that 
Um, and it's also important for folks to know what does PLI enforce versus, you know, what's enforced by other agencies and bodies. Um, and sometimes that is helpful um, as well to get people through the permitting process. Um, so again, be happy to talk um, with you more about your particular issue, um, but I do think um, you know, we're moving towards excellence on that front and certainly want um, folks to know upfront in the process exactly what it is that they need to do to get through the finish line uh, and open their business. Thank you. All right, um, Matt. Hello, um, I'm curious, are there newer um, versions of the code that are just yet to be adopted in PA or is it local that that's occurring? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the International Code Council adopts, which is the international body that creates these model codes, they update the codes every three years. So they came out with a 2018 code. They are working on issuing their 2021 code. Pennsylvania adopted 2015 and they are working on adopting 2018. So we're always, you know, a step behind. Um, but it seems like in the next few years, we'll probably be moving into the 2018 codes. Is there is there a reason why we're always like three or four years behind? And that like by the time we get to the 2018 code, there'll already be a 2021 code. And is there anything preventing the city from amending their existing codes to like call for stricter um, say like insulation, uh, like tighter building codes for better efficiency? Because it seems like if we wait six more years, that's just like potentially $6 billion worth of work done that really could be done better. I, I guess I don't understand what the holdup is. That's a great question. Um, so, and I agree with you on <laughs> many points on that. So we are opted into the state law. So uh, the state really controls the version level um, that we're adopting from. Can we have something stricter? Yes, um, but only in certain instances and through a, a certain process. So let's say um, city of Pittsburgh wanted to get really serious about energy code provisions because we wanted emissions from buildings to be X, Y, Z. There would be a public process that we'd have to go through here locally. There's a public process we'd have to go through through the state. Um, and you know they would vet that adoption at a local level because part of the state's concern is ensuring that when you build in the state of Pennsylvania, you're being basically treated to the same codes, no matter where you're building. Uh, so it, it, it's efficiency for builders. Um, there is one really important caveat though, um, which is the accessibility code. So the state adopts the most recent version of the code. So we're actually, a, we have already adopted uh, statewide the 28 accessibility building code. Um, so that's something that they do automatically. Um, they want to provide priority to the accessibility code. They want to make sure that persons with disabilities have the most recent code adoption, um, which is part of the reason why they do that. But they also have strict standards that say that a municipality cannot um, make any changes to those accessibility codes um, or go through that state process. We, we, do 2018 uh, and any variances or changes to an accessibility standard goes to the state. Is, is there a reason why they don't automatically adopt like the 2018 building code? Yeah, because they go through, I mean, there's, there's some bureaucracy there, right? So they have a public comment period where they say, hey, these are the 2018 codes. And by the way, builders, you're gonna have to do this this new mechanic on, on energy. And the building associations have their ability to say, hey, that's really expensive for us to do, or you know, this is gonna affect labor, or um, hey, this, you know, there's maybe some carve outs for a lumber issue. So those things get, you know, the sausage gets made and then they they issue it. Um, so, you know, that public process happens prior to adoption. And I just have one more question. Um, if we were going to try to push to adopt those codes sooner, who who is in charge of that process of overseeing like when we adopt the code and when we don't? Yeah, it's a great question. 
Um, the Department of Labor and Industry is the department that oversees the um, code adoption and has the secretary um, that oversees those, those codes um, and the advisory boards that review it, intake public comment and all that fun stuff. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, Larry? Thank you. I have a, a very different code question, Sarah. Uh, I recently helped one of my kids find an apartment and vetoed his first choice, which was in a, a very well-built and well-maintained building, but it was over 100 years old. And I reached an inspector at the fire department who confirmed, number one, that his ladders would not reach the top floors, and number two, that the single stairwell serving rather large floor plates was compliant because it was grandfathered. So it's great to keep uh, current on codes for new construction, but why is it okay to have tens of thousands of housing units that are still occupied built to the life safety standards of the early 1900s? I, I know it's expensive to make improvements, but there, there's a point where I think it's necessary to keep people safe. Right. Um, you know, on, on some points, I agree with you, but PLI cannot retroactively ask a property owner to make their um, structure code compliant to current code if they're not doing new work. Um, so, you know, in, in this case, if they hadn't pulled any permits because they haven't done any work, although it's hard to believe that over that long period of time that they aren't pulling permits from, you know, for some work that needs to happen, um, you know, PLI can't retroactively say, okay, well, now you got to widen your stairwells and create another one, um, do some interior demolitions to make this code compliant. Uh, to be clear, I was not criticizing you or your department for being derelict, but uh, it, it, it's a legislative challenge. Uh, is it okay to, to leave people in residential units or in office buildings that, that are, are governed by, by such antiquated safety standards? Certainly commercial, uh, you know, when, when people are doing work and they're pulling permits, we're doing a review and we want them to meet uh, the most recent code uh, requirements to get their certificates of occupancy. So, you know, change does happen over a period of time. Um, but, you know, you know, to be frank, it's a real life safety challenge. Um, I think that's why our fire and life safety inspector uh, unit is so important because they are ensuring that the fire and life safety systems that are in these buildings, um, these high occupancy buildings like apartment buildings are working. Um, so that folks can can get out, but um, certainly understand where you're coming from. Um, but there are limitations on when PLI can act and enforce. Um, I have a direct question. Um, it's um, oh. can a property owner have? Um, I guess if a fire destroys a property, can it be demolished by the city of Pittsburgh? Um, that can happen. So um, if there's a catastrophic fire um, and it's unsafe and might affect um, a cartway, an adjacent structure, um, you know, it's imminently dangerous. As a public safety measure, PLI may go out and do um, a, um, a demolition on that structure. So that is possible. Um, I think we have a question from Allie. Yeah, uh, could you describe some of the interagency um, coordination um, between the department and um, mobility and infrastructure or any other um, city departments? Sure. Um, thanks for asking. Uh, I think our our strongest partnership was with the Department of City Planning because zoning and building go hand in hand. Um, where you put something is just as important as how you build something, right? So um, an industrial type building shouldn't probably go next to a daycare, right? Um, how a neighborhood looks uh, and its setbacks, it matters. It matters uh, for the community that, that lives there. and. Um, zoning and the Department of City Planning are um, 
providing guidance and requirements based on you know community needs and wants on how or what can be built and we are providing the guidance and requirements on how it should be built um, and together we work hand in hand um, to ensure a, a you know a safe built environment so when someone applies for a permit um, and we uh, notice that there is a or the system we should say depending on the work scope will trigger, hey, there's a zoning review required on this. And we will ensure that that zoning development review application gets in the door. Um, you know, in a similar way, there are DOMI reviews or the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure reviews that have to do with um, the right of way. So, um, you know, what that sidewalk is gonna look like, what is the exit and entrance of uh, cars that are coming in and out of that, that building and that structure. That's a review um, that zoning works with uh, Domi on to ensure that we're we're looking at the the full development. Um, PLI is kind of the the gatekeeper of all that, right? We don't issue our permits until those other city agencies give the the thumbs up um, and the the seal of approval. Um, so those are how we currently work with our um, sister departments and development agencies. We have some work to do um, to align our reviews, uh, make that a smoother and more streamlined process. And that's something that we're working on. Um, but we're all now working in the same one-stop PDH system. So, you know, step one, check. Um, a lot of the other work is behind the scenes. All right, um, Andrea? I would like to know if you are answering the private questions in the chat or do you want to wait afterwards? Oh, hey, Andrea, I answered the one about uh, the fire uh, demolition. Did you get that one? Yes, I did. Thank you. There was okay. And then there's another one. Uh, what is the cost and call 311 on procedure? What is the cost? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding that one, Andrea. Follow up on the first one, I asked, what was the following procedures? Do I call 311 or what was the cost to have it demolish? I think she's asking um, if about like if a building is destroyed by a fire, can you request to have the building demolished by the city? Is that right, Andrea? Right, and then what is the cost? And what is the, uh, do you call 311? to have the procedure done? So uh, to be clear, PLI would only be de doing a demolition on something that's eminently dangerous. This means the structure is going to fall onto the street. It's going to fall onto an adjacent property that's occupied. Um, so we're really dealing with um, emergencies. So we would get called out. What, what would happen is you know, it's a 911 issue a PLI um, staffer would be called up by um, the emergency responder team, um, the folks that are on, on the site. At that time, we're making an assessment, hey, is this going to harm you know, a member of the public or an adjacent building, et cetera? Um, if yes, emergency definitely. Um, sometimes fires can happen and the structure is you know, sound inside um, or can last, in which case, you know, you can't request that PLI come out and do a demolition. It's up to the property owner to demolish that. Unfortunately, we see uh, properties deteriorate over time and they end up in our court, uh, but that's not how that should work. It should be the owners taking responsibility. If we do have to do a demolition, we lean the property, the cost of the demolition. So we have a contract with uh, demolition companies. Um, we, it's an emergency, they come out and they do what's called a curbside bid um and they bid on site we take the lowest bidder um, per our you know procurement requirements and they do demolition hopefully next day um that's how emergency demolitions happen we have another sort of demolition path um using uh capital community development block grant block grant funds um it takes a really long time to get through that process so um certainly we can have a condemned property on our list um, one thing that we've adopted recently is a scoring system on our condemned properties is we want to know which of these properties are in the green uh, and URA should do something with them or in the red and we need to think about how much money we're going to need to demo in the next year. 
Um, and, you know, so we're constantly adding things um, to this list. There's about 1,700 properties in the city uh, that would qualify. Um, but, you know, so I guess, it, sorry, this is a long-winded way of answering your question, which is there is a fire in a, in a building, you know, unless it's coming down, we're not going to come down and, or come out and demolish it. Um, we could add it to the CDBG list, but it's going to take quite some time to demolish it through that means as well. Oh, well, it was a joint to a uh, property next door. It was connected by the wall. And that property is owned by another person. That other person has died. So trying to handle it is complicated. So I just wanted to know, do you call 311 or do you call the city? Certainly all complaints can go through 311, but this could be a fun example to use the building eye. Can I have the address? 639 Bakerlow Street. Property is 637 Bakelow Street. 1527. Nothing. Yeah, let's put that in 311. <laughs> I don't see anything on that on that address. Thank you. And I asked a question. The first question was about the lot to a private to you, Sarah. This is another property. I own six properties. Yep, I'm not not exactly sure what this means uh, regarding taxes. Well, if I can't find the information on the Allegheny County tax page, where do I get the information from concerning maintenance? Oh, gotcha. Yeah, this is a this is a problem for PLI. So, um, nor like members of the public probably won't be able to get additional information. So, if I can just maybe clarify the question, um, when folks are when we're citing folks. Uh, we use Allegheny County as our source of truth on their addressing and their contact information. So um, that's where tax information gets sent. So we will take their, their addressing information from there. Sometimes uh, owners pass away um, and there's no one to take care of the property and the taxes aren't being paid. Those are nuisance properties for PLI and uh, you know take up a lot of our time. Internally, for code enforcement agencies and for governments, there are search tools uh, that um, we're actually gaining, hopefully in 2021, um, such as like JNA and Accurate. We can try to look up additional information to find a responsible owner. Um, so that would be something that PLI could do. Um, in other venues, uh, you know, as, as a private property owner, you're, you're kind of in a pickle. Um, I don't know, unless you're trying to acquire the property otherwise, um, you know, it's your, there's not a lot of options to track down a responsible owner. So it's a pain point all around. Uh, well, if all I right. have a fence put on my lot and it, I don't have clear lines of the property owner's lot, can I not overstep the boundaries? In that case, you would pay to get a survey done, right? So someone would come out, they would survey just your land, they would let you know, hey, is where your lot lines are this is where you should be building the fence all right thank you all right i think we have time for a couple more here um jacob yeah uh sarah just going back to larry's question when you guys were talking you had made mention of like it's hard to believe that um you know a grandfathered building wouldn't have had permits pulled that got me thinking how does pli um work with commercial or even residential properties that perhaps did do work, but they didn't pull permits? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so depending on the scope of work, sometimes we have to make them reopen a pulse, right? So first things first, they got to pull a permit. Um, after they pull a permit, we need to inspect the work. Um, you know, it's, it is unfortunate. Um, you know, we've had people who've had to jackhammer uh, sidewalks so that we can look at the, the tap and piping for a suppression system. 
if you cover up the work, uh, we can attest to it. We can issue the certificate of occupancy. So it is incredibly expensive um, and certainly a fight uh, when people do work and we don't get to witness it. Um, there is a, you know, a, a limitation to that though. So if things happen like five years ago, we're not gonna be tearing up walls. It has to be pretty recent um, and something that you know, had, has been flagged and triggered. And you know, going back to our right of entry, um, you know, usually we're catching things that are you know, near and close to a permitting process that's happening. Um, inspection, or I should say permitted work that, or non-permitted work that should have been permitted um, that's happening internal to a structure is hard for us to inspect because we can't just go barging in and saying, aha, I, you know, your neighbor said that you're doing such and such, uh, we caught you. Um, usually doesn't happen that way. So it is a, it's difficult on an enforcement end um, for the internal work like that. So basically if, um, and I'm thinking more commercially, right? But I mean, I mean I'm sure it happens res residentially all the time too, but so unless someone is flagging it, it, it just happens then. We might not know, but you know, Pittsburgh, we have, our neighbors are close, right? Um, people are, um, have their eye out uh, on when work is occurring. Um, but yeah, it can, it can be difficult certainly to enforce. Cool. Thank you. But, yeah, sure. My office, just a side note, my office gets multiple calls a day from neighbors, um, which Director Kinter knows. My neighbor is building a fence. Do they have a permit? My neighbor is doing this. Do they have a permit? It's very common behavior. <laughs> um, also, just a side note on the topic of Larry's question with the fire safety. Um, I seem to remember there was something passed fairly recently with sprink for, uh, sprinkler requirements, even for older buildings. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how that came to be? So that's a fire bureau uh, requirement um, and an inspection under the capacity of the IFC. Um, so I, I can't speak to it um, okay. too well, but uh, it was passed, I wanna say in 2017. Gotcha. Yeah, so just as an example of maybe another route that an agency can take to improve at least fire safety within the city. I think, I don't have the details of that, but I, I believe um, they were kind of bringing it in over like a 12 year period or something like that to even the older grandfathered in buildings, no new work. They all need a certain amount of sprinklers. Um, Allie, you have another question? I do, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Director Kinter, um, just sort of comparative um, question. Um, you know, Pittsburgh's a, a smaller city and, but the surge in commercial um, permits in the graph you showed since 2014 is, um, I mean, it's, it's big. I, I don't like follow this closely, um, you know, and, and development in, in those numbers, but um, from the standpoint of like safety and also like construction and, and labor issues, um, if you look at, you know, another city to the east, say Philadelphia, like the um, license and inspection um, department there, I know had, was a big uh, like focal point because of some really shoddy commercial construction. And I wonder what you think structurally Pittsburgh has in place that the city has in place that your department does that prevents some of the growth that can compromise um, building integrity and you know construction worker safety and public safety. That's a great question. Um, I think our biggest limitation is boots on the ground. Um, our department has completely transformed uh, in before 2014. Um, we didn't have as many building inspectors as we have and as many certified um, staff as we have now. So our building inspectors now are currently certified in accessibility, fire, mechanical, building and energy codes. And so they're really comprehensive in their inspection work. 
um, which is, you know, a, a standard of excellence. And certainly um, on our plan review uh, side, we have a similar standard of excellence where we have a lot of certifications. Um, but that was 2014 moving forward. Um, it's comprehensive, um, but it's, it's fairly new. And, you know, it, it takes time to do a thorough inspection. Um, so I think, you know, having a, um, a staffing complement that can actually keep up with what you're noting, which is a really high volume of work, is a challenge to ensuring safety of our environment. Um, so, you know, certainly we, we do the best we can, but the construction industry is go, go, go. Um, and we are constantly butting heads uh, on um, keeping within timeframes and trying to meet that demand. I'm not sure if that answered all of your question or if you want to uh, pose a piece of that in a different way for me to answer. It, do, it does. I you know I, when I gave the Philadelphia example because there were some really high profile like tragic situations with like a, one particular center city building, you know, collapse and workers who died, right? So I think you spoke to some of the, you know, boots on the ground that are important from a department capacity standpoint that can prevent, you know, that sort of failure that costs lives. So your answer sounded comprehensive, thanks. I think one other thing to note on that front is, uh, if you guys remember the the Frick building cornice that had fallen onto Grant Street at like 3 a.m. one morning, um, you know, from the top of the building, like shrapnel uh, on the ground, and thankfully no one was around um, at that time. But you know, it's those those are the types of things that keep me up at night. Um, those are the types of things that uh, you know we need to do thorough inspections on and facade inspections um especially of these high density areas so you know scale wise you know philadelphia is, a, is certainly a different animal but um it's really about having capacity to do that work um you know when i had talked about how many inspections our inspectors are doing each day um on our construction side we're doing five um, construction inspectors operations inspectors they are doing a lot in high volume um, we can't spread them any thinner. Um, so it's a, it's a real challenge. All right, and we will have our last question from Matt and then we'll take a break. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any additional money in the budget next year going to you guys, because I interact with your department all the time and um, I've always had good interactions with all the inspectors and they're definitely thorough um, but they are definitely moving at a very fast pace. And I don't think they're um, like negligent. I think they know the company that I work for and, and trust us. But I mean, a lot of times they are in and out and maybe 15 minutes, like they blast right through that. And I know that's because of the volume. And I'm just wondering if there's any additional funding that you know that's headed in your department's direction. Unfortunately, the um, COVID-19 pandemic has hit the city with a, a pretty big budget hole. Um, and we're actually in budget season right now. So PLI has been in front of city council, other departments are in front of city council. And, um, you know, the, the approach has been to make sure people don't lose their jobs. Um, so there was some freezes, there are some vacancies, and unfortunately, PLI is going to see, um, you know, as it currently stands, some cuts to the department, um, you know, but I'll, I think all departments are going to see some cuts because of that big budget hole. Um, it really hurts. Um, uh, for, I know all directors are feeling this way. Um, we're trying to get through. We're really hoping for some federal relief to plug those budget holes because um, you know, to your point, Matt, and your point, Allie, um, you know, having staff um, is what ensures that we can get through these thorough inspections and make sure that the built environment is safe. So um, in an ideal world, we would be growing the staff, um, but our budget is such that we're probably not going to see that in 2021. Well, on that bright note, <laughs> 
Um, yeah, and I we actually heard from the Office of Management and Budget and Department of Finance for our previous Civic Leadership Academy session, and I think um, they did speak to uh, a little bit about how those budget cuts may be affecting departments um, for the year to come. So uh, you can also there's a lot um, there's a lot of resources online at the city of Pittsburgh's website if you're interested in the budget for next year. Um, and you can also the budget is still in city council's hands. Um, like the director sort of hinted to, we're in a pretty uh, tough place, just trying to to keep everyone in their jobs, but. Um, you know, reaching out to your council person and, and advocating for some of your priorities could never hurt. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna give director a hand clap <laughs> on Zoom if others would like to. Um, other than that, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate the conversation and the presentation. Um, we're gonna take a five minute break here and come back at 725 for the housing authority. Thanks so much. Take care, Thanks. guys. All right. Welcome back. I hope everyone got a nice micro break in. Did some stretches. Um, all right, so we will move right along. So here today from the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, we have J.P. Leskovich, who is the communication specialist, Sunshine Pryor, who is the associate director of compliance, and Anthony Chaffee, who is the real estate as asset manager. Um, so I am going to kick it over to J.P. to start us off. Hi, J.P. Thanks for being Hello. here. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys for having us. So we are the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh. Um, so just to give you a quick rundown of what we're going to talk about, I'll give you um, a quick introduction, what we are, um, our organizational structure, our history. Um, Anthony will talk to you about programs and operations and public safety. I'll talk to you about resident services. And then Sunshine will wrap it up with our development and modernization initiatives and how you do business with us. Um, so let's get, oh, and the other thing I wanted to say was we don't have any slides specifically dedicated to COVID. We'll probably all talk about it. Um, and if you, if you have any questions, just ask us them at the end. Um, so let's get started. So Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, what are we, what do we do? Uh, so the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, HACP, is a public housing authority. It's the local public housing authority in Pittsburgh. Um, and we provide publicly assisted housing to Pittsburgh residents um, through two programs. And that includes uh, the traditional low-income public housing um, and the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, so what all does that entail? Um, in terms of property management, we own and operate over 2,500 low-income public housing units. Uh, we support over 700 units um, in mixed income sites. Um, and in addition to that, we administer 5,600 housing choice vouchers for people throughout the city. Um, and we developed mixed income housing communities, modern senior citizen communities and newer housing stock in addition to providing services for our residents and so much more, which we'll talk about as we get going. Um, so in terms of our organizational structure, just give you guys a quick overview of how we uh, are governed, how we function, and how we make our decisions. Uh, so we are established under federal and state laws uh, by a city ordinance. And what that means is that we are federally funded and regulated uh, through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, but we are locally governed. Uh, so we are governed, our governing body is a board of commissioners which is composed of seven mayoral appointees, five of whom must be approved by the city council and one of whom must be one of our residents uh, to ensure that there's some sort of uh, resident representation on the decision-making body. Um, and those seven uh, commissioners elect their own chair. And then in terms of you know, everyday operations, day-to-day, -day, that kind of stuff, we, there's an executive director um, who oversees the everyday operations of the agency and they report uh, to the board of commissioners. So where have we been? Before we can get to where we are, where have we been? What's our history? Um, so like I said, we were established uh, under federal and state law and that law that we were established under was the US Housing Act. So after President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the US Housing Act, uh, the city of Pittsburgh created the first housing authority in Pennsylvania uh, and the country and we were founded. That was August 26, 1937. Uh, so then after our founding, you know, 
we were one of the first housing authorities in the country. We didn't have much. So the first seven years, the first couple years of our you know, existence. We're really focused on building communities, maintaining those communities, and kind of, you know, we built seven housing developments. Uh, you can see them there, Bedford Dwellings, Addison Terrace, Alcliffe Terrace, Arlington Heights, Allegheny Dwellings, Glen Hazel, and Broadhead Manor. These were some of the first housing, uh, public housing communities in the country. Uh, they were really uh, forward thinking for the time, and actually that picture there is from when uh, Franklin FDR came and visited, I believe it was for the opening of Addison Terrace. It may have been Bedford Dwellings, but I'm pretty sure it was for Addison Terrace. So it was a really exciting time. Uh, everything, everything was new. The president came and visited. Um, so that's our, our early days. Um, and so in the decade after that, we really focused on, you know, maintaining our housing. We expanded it slightly, but there wasn't a huge change. Uh, anything big in HCP's history until the 1960s when we started developing our first scattered sites. Uh, and scattered sites are basically exactly what they sound like. Uh, they are housing sites that are scattered throughout the city. So instead of the uh, units being in a all in one community, like let's say with Bedford Dwellings, they would instead be uh, one house in Hazelwood, one house in Stanton Heights and things like that. Um, so then after that, in the 1970s, we moved into the new decade, the 70s, uh, and our focus shifted. We focused more on providing housing to senior residents and residents with disabilities. Uh, and to you know, accomplish that, we constructed 12 high-rise communities that were um, that are specifically for uh, senior residents and residents for disabilities. Those 12 high-rise communities we still manage today, and they're still um, designated specifically for senior residents and residents with disabilities. In the middle of the 70s, 1976, is when the federal government established uh, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, also known as Section 8. Uh, so then in the 1980s, that's really what was dominating um, our activity. It was expanding the Housing Choice Voucher Program, connecting with landlords, getting people connected with landlords, really establishing the program in the city of, picture, of Pittsburgh, making sure it was up and running um, and really going. And then in the 90s, there was another pivot uh, towards public and private partnerships, you know, instead of just funding things through the government, we started leveraging some private funds to begin Hope 6 um, redevelopments. And what Hope 6 redevelopments were is these were, this was an initiative from the federal government through uh, public housing authorities across the country to kind of use public and private money to invest in um, mixed income communities to help uh, improve the upper trajectory of residents in that community. Uh, you can see this picture here. Uh, that's Oak Hill um, in West Oakland. It was um, one of our Hope Six uh, communities. It was one of the first in the country. Um, a very big deal, and it's a still a really successful a mixed income community. You can go there now. It's very vibrant. A lot going on. Um, maybe a little different during COVID, but usually. Uh, so then, you know, we've really focused on that since then. So that kind of brings us up, you know, generally to the 21st century. So where are we now? Uh, so we. Now, we are Pittsburgh's largest landlord and premier provider and developer of quality affordable housing. We are engaged in development in the Hill District, East End and North Side. Um, some of that development is redevelopment of existing communities. Some, some of it's new development. A lot of it is mixed income development. A lot of it are those public private partnerships that I was talking about. Um, but we'll talk more about some of our specific developments and how we do that uh, later in the presentation. But you can see our pictures here, very modern. We're really trying to when we design things for our residents, we're thinking, how can we really implement, you know, modern sustainable design in a way that is affordable and will really be accessible to people um, as well. So we have in the top left, the Miller Street Apartments, uh, in the top right, Sandstone Quarry, the bottom left, Cornerstone Village in Larimer, and then the bottom right is a scattered site and that's in East Liberty. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's where we are today. Um, and in terms of who we serve and who, uh, who our um, residents are, who the, the population is that we uh, help, uh, we provide housing or housing subsidy to approximately 8,600 households and that totals at 18,700 people approximately. So that's around 7% of all city of Pittsburgh residents either receiving housing or housing subsidy from the housing authority of the city of Pittsburgh. And as you can see, so as you can see, we have a really large reach. We're really um, impacting a lot of people. So our services, all these things, um, there's a large population that we're dealing with. So that we keep that in mind whenever we are making decisions about services or developments or things like that, that there is a large number of people that our decisions are impacting and that we are um, providing housing and services to. 
Um, so that's the brief intro. So I'm going to, you know, uh, give it over to Anthony Chaffee now. He can start talking to you about our different housing programs that we have, as well as some of our operations. Great. Thanks, JP. And I apologize to everybody in advance. When it comes to affordable housing, I can get a little bit chatty. So <laughs> John, when you're ready to jump into your slides, please just give me the thumbs up and I'll go ahead and uh, end my conversation. Uh, but like JP said, my name is Anthony Chaffee. I'm the real estate asset manager for the housing authority. Uh, basically, that means that I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and management of our low-income public housing portfolio. Uh, Low-income public housing program is HACP owned and operated assistant housing. Uh, the properties are privately owned by the housing authority um, and day-to-day -day operations are handled by a team of seven site managers, eight assistant site managers, uh, several administrative office assistants, a bilingual uh, administrative liaison who speaks five African dialects uh, for our, our uh, population in Northview Heights and approximately 35 laborers and janitors. Um, initial eligibility for low-income public housing is determined by our occupancy department and is capped at 80% of the area median income. Uh, an example that JP provided for us was a two-person household. Uh, maximum income allowable for that family would be $53,150 per year. Uh, when determining the rents for those families for low-income public housing, we use 30% of the gross household income, so total household income. Um, residents are responsible to pay that 30% and in some cases uh, responsible for utilities as well. Uh, for the residents who are responsible for their utilities, we do apply an allowance to their monthly rent charge. Our utility allowances are adjusted annually. Um, based off of several facts, including unit characteristics, uh, utility rates charged by our local utility companies, and standard consumption rates. There we go. Ah, yes. Thought maybe you gave it to me. Um, as JP said earlier, HACP owns and operates uh, over 2,500 public housing units. It's a uh, as of today, 2,548. That includes 300 scattered site units throughout the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, our most recent scattered sites are 20 new construction development in East Liberty as part of the Larmer Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant Program. Uh, under development and modernization, Sunshine will give you a lot more information about the CNIG program, uh, but the most recent addition to our portfolio is the 20 units in East Liberty. Our bedroom sizes range anywhere from studio apartments in some of our high rises to six bedroom units in Homewood North. And the total consists of five family communities, which are Northview Heights, Allegheny Dwellings, Arlington Heights, Bedford Dwellings, and Homewood North. Uh, we also have in our inventory, or I'm sorry, in our portfolio at this time, 10 senior citizen and disabled priority communities throughout the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, as JP said, back in the 70s, we built roughly 12 to have been um, taken down over the years to kind of follow suit with the trend of the city. And that land has been repurposed for other mixed income opportunities. Which leads us into our mixed finance housing communities. Uh, there are two types of mixed finance communities that are handled by the Asset Management Department of the Housing Authority those being our traditional mixed finance communities as well as non-traditional mixed finance. Uh, for the traditional mixed finance portfolio, that would include communities such as Bedford Hills, uh, New Penley Place, and Garfield Commons. In those cases, the agency has regulatory oversight and are more involved in the way that the communities are ran due to um, those developments, including public housing dollars. So there are public housing units available in those communities. For the non-traditional mixed finance communities, uh, the, agency, the agency has less involvement because we simply hold a financial interest. And that could be through loans that were given to the developer or the availability of housing vouchers. Uh, a good example of a non-traditional mixed finance community would be the newly constructed Skyline Terrace uh, in the Hill District. 
in addition to low income public housing and mixed finance, the city of Pittsburgh Housing Authority also offers a housing choice voucher program. Uh, it's tenant based housing assistance in privately owned rental properties. Uh, the property based housing assistance um, calculates income eligibility at 50% of the area median income, uh, which is a little bit different from public housing, which is at 80. So you'll see the income limits for a family of two under the housing choice voucher program is 33,200. And we will also um, further down into the presentation, give a breakdown from smaller family size up to families of eight. Uh, same breakdown here, the tenants pay 30% of the household income towards their rent plus applicable utilities. There is also a utility allowance applied to rent totals for our housing choice voucher program participants. The map provided here shows you a geographic distribution of the housing choice vouchers as of April of 2018. Uh, so you can see there is utilization in most areas of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, Recently, uh, the Housing Authority has issued location-based payment standards in specific opportunity zones. Uh, those opportunity zones include uh, Shadyside, Lower Lawrenceville, the Strip District, Downtown, and Squirrel Hill. Uh, the opportunity zones were identified based off of their walkability um, and additional advantages to the residents that are utilizing the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So this is the overall general breakdown of the admission criteria income limits. Uh, so you will see that the housing choice voucher program is a bit lower because it goes off of 50% of the area median income uh, with public housing going off of 80%. Uh, so for a family of one, the maximum income allowable under public housing would be 46,500. Um, and this will show you a chart all the way going up to families of eight. So a family of eight could earn 87,650 under public housing or 54,800 under the housing choice voucher program. Uh, prior to receiving a housing choice voucher program or moving into one of the public housing or mixed finance communities, uh, there are certain factors that are screened by our occupancy department that affect eligibility. Um, of course, as we talked about, annual income uh, in excess of the identified maximum limits would determine somebody to be ineligible. Uh, we also do landlord verifications to determine if there are any outstanding balances owed not just to another public housing authority, but also to private landlords. Uh, that can include unpaid rent, maintenance charges, or outstanding legal fees with a local district judge. Uh, we also complete a criminal history on all of our applicants. Um, convictions for drug possession or sales, any disorderly conduct or physical violence charges, and other criminal activity could adversely um, affect somebody's eligibility. Uh, any applicant who is withdrawn from the program does have the opportunity to file a grievance, um, in which case we would have a third party grievance officer review the findings of the housing authority take additional testimony and comments from the applicant and then make a determination based off of uh, that hearing to determine whether or not the person should be made eligible uh, regardless of the criminal background or the rental history that they may have had. Uh, the HACP Home Ownership Program is open to anyone who is eligible for rental assistance programs and purchasing a home in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, through the housing Authorities Home Ownership Program, we are able to offer up to $8,000 in closing cost assistance, as well as a soft second deferred payment mortgage of up to $52,000 uh, forgivable after 10 years. Second mortgage eligibility is based on the gross annual income of the applicant, a pre-approved mortgage payment and family composition. Uh, participants are required to attend a home buyer education workshop and pre-purchase counseling. Um, an additional benefit is that any participant in our scattered sites program uh, under the home ownership is also given the opportunity once qualified uh, to purchase the existing unit that they live in now. That would count for 
most of the scattered site units with the exception of certain ones that were purchased through specific federal dollars and the new East Liberty scattered sites that were built uh, through the Choice Neighborhood Implementation Program. Uh, of course, with a portfolio the size of ours, uh, in addition to tremendous support from the Pittsburgh Police Department, uh, the agency also has its own public safety service, which is ran by our director, Joy Picar. Uh, the public safety services that we provide for our residents and our communities include uh, camera surveillance and footage retention, guard services and exclusion list management, uh, silent complaint forms, and also anonymous tip lines uh, so that when there are concerns or quality of life issues that are identified out in the communities, uh, residents, neighbors, community partners have opportunity to make the housing authority aware so that we can correctively address those issues. Uh, part of our public safety strategy includes over 800 cameras throughout all of HACP's 15 low-income public housing communities. Uh, cameras can be found at each of our communities and senior disabled high-rises. And as part of that surveillance system, we do have the opportunity to secure and obtain footage. Uh, residents and community partners have the ability to submit footage requests directly to the housing authority. Uh, our camera servers do have the ability to, to retain footage for an average of approximately seven days, depending on the size of the site, the activity and the traffic that, um, that affects the motion sensored cameras. Uh, if a resident wishes to request a footage form, they can do so at their management office. Um, it is completed in its entirety by the resident and once submitted is submitted, once submitted to the management office is delivered to our public safety department. Uh, any footage request form that we process must include a CCR number uh, from the Pittsburgh Police Department and any footage that is obtained um, as a result of both internal or external requests is only released uh, to the police department or through subpoena. We don't release any footage or discuss the findings on that footage uh, with the resident that may be requesting that information. The agency also contracts professional security companies to ensure the public safety in our, in our community high rises as well as the Northview Heights community. Um, some of the services that are provided include checking the IDs of our visitors and residents um, and signing them in to ensure that they are not on the HACP's exclusion list. The security company also monitors our cameras throughout the night to ensure that there are no signs of incidents or dangers that may be posed for our residents. They do assist the police if necessary during active investigations or to de-escalate concerns in the community. Uh, they do provide access control to the sites and they may be armed or unarmed, depending on the, loco the, the location that they are stationed in. Um, our guards also work very closely with the police and uh, are part of our community engagement process. So over the years, they do build a rapport with our residents. Uh, they are trusted and they have the, um, the respect of the residents that they're serving. One of the huge successes that our public safety department has experienced recently was the implementation of the officer Kelvin Hall Public Safety Center at Northview Heights. Uh, the agency and the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police have an agreement to provide above baseline services for the north side communities of Northview Heights and Allegheny dwellings. That station includes a sergeant and six officers who are dedicated solely to the Northview Heights and Allegheny dwellings communities. Uh, as I said earlier, it was built in Northview Heights and includes community space that when not faced with COVID uh, is open to our residents for community meetings, resident engagement um, and other events that happen in the community. Um, the Housing Authority has taken steps to ensure that our residents continue to receive the same services that were available to them prior to COVID. Um, Part of that is working to ensure that we're hosting events outdoors or encouraging social distancing. Uh, many of our food distribution drops now are grab and go as opposed to um, more of a grocery style line. Um, so that was my bit on COVID that JP had mentioned earlier. 
Uh, a few slides ago, we discussed the HACP exclusion list. Uh, the exclusion list includes any individuals who have committed a crime or repeated acts of nuisance on housing authority property. Uh, residents who have been evicted for criminal activity are also added to the exclusion list. Um, each person added is sent notification and provided with the steps that they would need to follow if they would like to contest that placement. Uh, the list excludes them from all housing authority city of Pittsburgh communities and subjects them to prosecution for trespass if they are found to be on any of the on any of the properties. Uh, any person who is on the exclusion list does have the ability to make a petition to be removed after two years and convictions of certain offenses would disqualify the individuals for petition. The Public Safety Department also manages silent complaint forms and an anonymous tip line. Uh, silent complaint forms are available in all of our office, offices as well as the HACP website, www .hacp.org and complaints can also be submitted in the mail or via email at public safety at hacp.org. Uh, additionally, our public safety staff logs all complaint forms and determines the necessary actions to take. Uh, that's often done in partnership with both the agency's legal department as well as the management team for that specific community. All right. Alrighty, thank you, Anthony. I will take it back over from you. Um, so Anthony just gave you guys like a nice rundown of our operations and our like physical communities. Uh, but you know, the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh is not just a place to live. It's also a path to launch. We uh, really focus on investing in our resident services and promoting self-sufficiency. Uh, we invest more than $2 million per year in resident services, funding a wide range of programs. And I'll talk about some of those programs in a minute. Uh, but I, we really like this graphic right here because it really kind of sums up our approach to resident services. Cause you see this, the residents big and in the center there cause we center the resident in all of our services. We center the residents needs and we meet them where they are. All of these things are meant to surround them with resources and services so that way they can access what they need. So we have a number of programs from the family self-sufficiency program to Ross, to crisis management, to resident relations, choice neighborhoods, clinical coordination, computer training, STEAM, resident employment, all these things designed to give the resident what they need and meet them where they are. Um, like Anthony said, there have been some challenges from COVID, uh, especially at the beginning of the year when we had to really go online all at once. Um, but with the growing pains, we've moved a lot to a lot of remote uh, appointments, using tons of PPE and social distancing when in-person things are necessary necessary. Like he said, for the food delivery, we work a lot with a lot of partners like Foreign to Food Rescue and others. A lot of those have moved to outside deliveries and pickups or grab and go as opposed to like an indoor meal type setting. Um, and our digital, our digital literacy programs have also expanded and I'll speak on that a little bit. So um, let's dive into it. We really do care about our resident services here. So our first, oh, come on, is it not going to go? Is it, is it not going to? There we go. Okay, cool. All right. So one of our main uh, resident services is the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. This is kind of a big umbrella program that's really in that's introduced to people as soon as they uh, enter one of our housing assistance programs. Um, so it's a voluntary five-year program that facilitates upward mobility. The idea is, sell, is to facilitate self-sufficiency, get people on that path and give them the tools they need to reach self-sufficiency, whatever that means to them. So the way it works is our FSS coordinators uh, work with the clients, uh, that, that's the people who are receiving the assistance, uh, to, to talk to them and develop an individualized training and service plan to outline strengths, weaknesses, and goals. So they really meet one-on-one -on -one to figure out where are you, where do you want to be, what does self-sufficiency look like to you, what do we have to do to get you there, where, what are some challenges you're going to face, and then they also work with them to figure out how they can hold themselves accountable and how they're gonna track their progress. Um, so self FSS is one of our big programs uh, to really meet residents where they are uh, and help them create a plan for themselves, you know, with the assistance, with the, you know, the support of the housing authority. But the idea is to really, you know, make residents create that plan uh, so that they know we're not just taking a one size fits all approach. You know, the resident is really outlining their own path to self-sufficiency and we're just there to really support them and give them you know any push they need to get to succeed on that path that they set for themselves. 
Um, another big self-sufficiency program we have is the Resident Opportunity and Self-Sufficiency, the Ross program. Um, this one's funded by some grants actually, and this is kind of a bit of an alternative um, to uh, the FSS program. So it's available to all non-FSS participants in our five uh, family communities that Anthony mentioned, uh, Allegheny Dwellings, Arlington Heights, Bedford Dwellings, Homewood North, and Northview Heights. Uh, and what distinguishes Ross from FSS, it's a little more, is that it's a little more targeted than um, FSS is uh, in terms of, it's a little more narrow. FSS is kind of working one-on-one, -on -one, more, you know, kind of more social work oriented in the sense that it's working with them to establish their needs, their plan, that kind of thing. Whereas the Ross coordinators have specific goals and they work with residents to determine what skills they want to hone in terms of financial literacy, re-entry and employment. So what they'll do is they'll refer residents out to services they think that they could benefit them or bring these services directly to the communities. And like a great example of a Ross event uh, would be, and this was pre-COVID of course, because everyone was all in one big room inside, um, was the Dress for Success event that they had where they would they brought in a bunch of people to help. Uh, they brought in a clo uh, one of those closet organizations uh, to help talk about professional dress wear, show people how to dress for an interview, how to dress professionally, um, and give people that skill because you know that's something that could be easily overlooked and that could prevent someone from getting a job. Um, so it's things like that. Uh, and since the pandemic, a lot of these things have moved uh, more virtually, a lot of digital referrals, uh, things like that. Um, but they are working towards establishing some more events, some employment events and things like that. So that's the Ross program. And then another um, big employment program that we have is our resident employment program. So we really invest in our residents in that sense. So we're deeply committed uh, to making sure that our residents and our voucher holders have access to programs that lead to um, upper mobility and a higher quality of life. So we have our resident employment program that is specifically dedicated to that. And some of those initiatives include on-site mobile and computer skills training to make sure that people have those digital skills in an increasingly online world, um, a free driver's education uh, for residents. That's a very successful one because you know sometimes it'll require that you have a valid driver's license, but you don't have your driver's license yet, that could be a barrier to employment, which could be a barrier to self-sufficiency. We want to remove as many barriers as possible for our residents. We also have monthly career workshops this year. Uh, it was in September, a couple months ago, we had a whole online career fair uh, because of COVID. We, had, we couldn't have a big you know, career fair in mind, but we had it online. There were digital booths. People could talk to the um, employers over video camera. It was very exciting, very, very like, uh, cutting edge it felt like. So we're really making sure that we can still provide these programs to people despite the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has faced. Um, but that's only a few of those. Our uh, resident employment coordinator, Lloyd Wilson, works tirelessly. Uh, he's always sending me flyers uh, with different employers, with different programs, with different services to really connect people to employment, to create these employment programs and to really open up opportunities for residents so that way they can get that employment. Um, it's been relatively successful. In 2019, HACP helped 135 residents gain employment. Um, so we're very excited about that. 2020 has been a little different. Um, what with, you know, the pandemic hitting, we had to kind of rethink a lot of our programs. It's, it's been lower, um, but people still have been engaging with the resident employment program. Lloyd has still been connecting people with jobs. He's still been getting people employed. Hasn't been a, he's had more challenges than in the past, but he's been able to do it. So that's um, the resident employment program which is just another one of our resident services. Um, so this is a big one that I mentioned um, earlier. So another big way that we invest in our residents in terms of resident services is digital literacy and digital programming. There is um, a big gap um, in access uh, and digital access, uh, both in the city of Pittsburgh uh, and across the country in terms of a, uh, low income residents and people not necessarily having the access to Wi-Fi, not necessarily having the digital literacy skills they need to really take advantage of all the opportunities and resources that are at your fingertips when you're online. Uh, so for a while now, we've been part of a national effort called Connect Home, uh, and that's to bridge that digital divide and bring people online. So we have our uh, computer lab. We have our mobile computer lab that we go around do digital literacy workshops. Uh, we also had some programs where we had digital literacy classes and if you completed the class you could get a device um, and things like that. We were working to bring people online um, but you know with 
the COVID-19 pandemic hitting, these efforts really became critical because now getting online is no longer just something important. It, it was, you know, essential because everything moved online, mass migration of daily life online. Uh, so we really doubled down on these efforts um, and we were able to do a lot of really cool things. We worked with Comcast to provide Wi-Fi to our residents. We worked with uh, Pittsburgh Public Schools to provide uh, devices to all of the all of the Pittsburgh Public Schools for students living in HACP housing. Um, and we, you know, expanded. We, we did some digital literacy classes. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we brought people online. Um, and this kind of the COVID-19 pandemic really accelerated plans we already had. And then with that injection of CARES Act funds, we were able to invest in, you know, expanding Wi-Fi into our communities and these devices and things like that. Um, we bought tablets for people and things like that to make sure that uh, we, we had lessons on telehealth and connecting people to online health resources and things like that because there are so many things online and right now everything is online. We wanted to make sure that our residents had as much access to those things as um, me and everyone else in the city. Uh, so in terms of you know that telehealth, uh, so clinical coordination, it's another uh, service that we provide. So what does clinical coordination uh, look like at HACP? So um, clinical coordination here focuses on best practices and linkage, uh, case management, uh, preliminary assessments and coordination. Um, so they, uh, the coordinators support intensive care management referrals, coordination of care, and other divisions of RSS. So what, what does all this look like? What does that mean? So it could look like uh, referring someone to service linkage for drug and alcohol counseling. It could look like connecting them with mental health counselor or the Center for Victims or sending them over to Deanna in home ownership or any other basic needs. Um, the staff, the clinical coordination staff uh, conducts evaluations and assessments. Uh, to connect residents to appropriate resources. And then this is like that FSS, so that one-on-one -on -one, uh, support before referral to make sure that, so the coordinators stop and they really make sure that they're listening to what the residents are saying, that they're really honing in on what that need is and then very, and then referring them out based on that specific need and not kind of having like a very rote, when someone comes in with this issue, send them here. It's very much a um, individualized, approach. Um, another thing I wanted to mention with clinical coordination in terms of bringing medical resources to our residents is a, a partnership that we've had recently with the Duquesne University School of Pharmacy. So clinical coordination can look like literally physically bringing health screenings and flu shots in, directly into our communities uh, to make sure with social distancing and PPE, of course, and all outside, uh, to make sure that residents still have access to uh, health care because and health resources because you know COVID-19 has exacerbated health inequalities in the city so um, you know our re resident services also means uh, keeping our finger on the pulse in terms of what issues our residents are facing and responding directly to that and our partnership with uh, the School of Pharmacy um, is a good example of that. Um, so another big way that we invest in residents is our youth services. Uh, there are a lot of young people at the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh. We house over 7,000 young people, around 700 of them are under the age of five. Um, and, you know, young minds are precious. Young minds are impressionable. They're really important. And we take that very seriously. Uh, so we actively seek out ways that we can expand opportunities for these young residents. For these young um, and that includes working with partners like BJW, BJWL, to provide on-site after-school services, um, collaborating with the Duquesne University and the ABK Early Childhood and Learning Development Center, um, which I'll talk about more in a second, and offering an interactive and audiovisual training at the Creative Arts Corner, as well as our Clean Slate programs. Um, so I'll talk a little more about that now. Uh, so one of the big our, uh, kind of crown jewels of our youth services is the ABK Early Childhood Learning and Development Center at Bedford Dwellings. Um, so that's a collaboration with ABK as well as the Duquesne University School of Education. And what that is, is, is it's a 24 seven childcare center um, in Bedford Dwellings. And the idea behind it is to implement um, the newest research on early childhood education directly into the curriculum um, there. To, and that's our, where our engagement with uh, Duquesne comes in to make sure that these children are receiving basically the high, the cutting, cutting edge early childhood education, but it's, it's not just the curriculum and stimulating their minds and making sure they're getting the correct, you know, 
education and activities, but it's also the structure of the um, program itself. So it's 24 seven and they provide care in those uncommon hours. And that's a big deal in a city like Pittsburgh where, you know, we have tons of healthcare, tons of service industry and, you know, night shifts, 7P to 7A, that can be a very common thing um, in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh. So what the idea is, is to make sure when you're working those night night shifts, you know, you're missing a lot of the regular hours for childcare. That can either mean you have to pay extra for childcare, you can't get childcare, it can make it harder to find a job, it can make it harder to keep a job, it can be a major barrier to you. Um, and that's why we made sure that this is available to people any time of day. So that way they do have one of those night shifts, one of those uncommon shifts, they can still get childcare. And that was a really big part of this. Another big thing that we've done with this recently, and we recently completed this, uh, is the nature-based play area. And that was another big collaboration with Duquesne uh, to make sure that we could design a play area for these students to learn with their hands, to get dirty, to get in the dirt. Because a lot of studies show that that's, you know, nature-based play is really, really integral in early childhood development. And it can really put a child um, ahead. Uh, so we wanted to make sure there was a really great way, a research-based way, for kids to engage with that. So we have an, our new nature-based play area. It has tubes for them to crawl through. It has an August Wilson stage for them to put on their own little plays. Um, and we're, we're, very, we're very excited about that. So that's one of our big things in terms of youth services is the ABK Early Child and Learning Development Center. It's available to all HACP residents. Um, it's currently full, uh, but it's very popular. People love it. Uh, we're very happy with it. Some of our other programs, and I mentioned these earlier, uh, for, is uh, the Creative Arts Corner, uh, which has two locations in Bedford Dwellings, Northview Heights. Uh, so what this does is it offers residents a free audiovisual production program so they can learn how to make videos, they can learn how to produce music, they can learn how to do photography, things like that. So this is a great way to provide um, you know, young residents with a way to express themselves, engage in something, pour themselves into something passionately. But more than that, it also gives people an opportunity to learn a trade. So if people are interested in media production, if they're interested in going into music or any of these things, this is all professional grade equipment they'd be working on. So they can learn how to use these things, how to use this equipment, they can build up their portfolio. We have had some people get jobs with media in media production because of their involvement at the Creative Arts Corner. Um, and this is really one of a kind. There isn't really another housing authority that has a program like the Creative Arts Corner. Um, so just kind of another way of that we are finding every possible way to support our residents and give them um, those special services that um, create a path to launch. Um, and another big thing is CleanSite E3. Uh, CleanSite E3 is AGCP's nonprofit affiliate. Uh, the E3 stands for Educate, Entertain, and Encourage. Uh, so it focuses on education. Its main thing is a scholarship program uh, that supports low-income public housing and HCV high school graduates. Uh, to date, Clean Slate has dispersed, uh, and I believe with the 2020 numbers, it's over $300,000 in funds over the past 10 years to around 50 students. Um, so that's a big, big uh, program that we have. And Clean Slate doesn't just have the scholarship program. It also does a STEAM Fest every year. We weren't able to do it this year uh, because of COVID. But there's, we have a big STEAM Fest every year where we introduce students to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics uh, to really catalyze a love of learning and instill a lifelong curiosity in these young minds. Um, so when it comes down to it though, uh, we are very, when it comes to resident services, we leverage every single resource that we have. We partner with every single person we can across the city to bring services to our residents. Investments of $500,000 have yielded $4 million in services because we really do every single penny, we stretch that out. So from that, because of our partnerships with Allegheny, the County Department of Health and Human Services, the Area Agency on Aging, Reading is Fundamental, Youth Places, 4 and 2 Food Rescue, Gateway Health Plan, so many more. I could not name them off the top of my head. I swear every week I'm posting about a new partnership. We really do seek out partnerships to leverage our resources and bring services to our residents so that way they, to improve their quality of life and create vibrant communities where they can thrive and find a place to launch. Um, so that was an overview of our resident uh, services. If you have any questions about them, you can ask me about them at the end. Uh, but now I'm gonna pass it off to Sunshine uh, to talk about our development and modernization initiatives, um, as well as doing business with us. 
Thank you, JP. So the Housing Authority has a Development and Modernization Department, which is responsible for developing plans, identifying resources, and implementing capital improvements, as well as managing public and or private partnership opportunities to ensure the value um, of the properties and effective use and proper management of our real estate assets. Our department manages major rehabilitation of infrastructures and facilities. Uh, we also are involved in demolition and site development, as well as non-routine repairs and upgrades of the Housing Authority's buildings and property. Um, on this slide, with regard to development, uh, we're showing a few photos, but essentially, with this portion of our department, we're focused on creating sustainable, viable, and mixed income communities. And over the next 10 years, we do have planned more than 240 million in affordable housing development. Um, you may have heard the term mixed income development um, earlier. Um, these initiatives uh, are being managed through our department and they usually involve leveraging private funds, which can you know, equate to two to three times public investments. Um, and in the bottom right corner, you'll notice the little snippet that since 2000, um, we have accomplished more than 1700 new mixed income units. Um, and we have more in our plans um, because essentially there is a need for increased affordable housing within the city of Pittsburgh. Next slide, please. Just gonna highlight a couple of um, examples of these types of projects that we're involved in. Um, on this slide, you're seeing reference to one that is called Sandstone Quarry. This is a newer built development that's actually located on the north side. Um, and if you're familiar with the north side of Pittsburgh, you might um, be aware of a low income public housing property in that area called Allegheny Dwellings. This effort uh, culminating in this new construction was the redevelopment of the first phase of redeveloping Allegheny Dwellings. It is a mixed income property that resulted. The name Sandstone Quarry actually originates from prior to the low income public housing being built there. There used to be an actual quarry on that site. Um, now, this project, it's mixed income um, and let me see, it actually earned several awards uh, of recognition related to its design. Um, one of those, you know, was given um, by the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. And as well, the um, earlier this year, uh, the American Institute of Architects um, provided an honor award for the design related to this project. Um, Sandstone Quarry, it actually contains like 65 uh, units. They are mixed income, uh, about uh, 47 of those are considered affordable, 18 of them are market rate, and the bedroom sizes can range anywhere from one to three bedroom units. Um, and we do have some project-based voucher units there. Uh, I think the construction for this actually was completed in early 2019. If we can go to the next project or the next slide, sorry. Okay. Okay, on this slide, you're seeing some photos. Um, this is an example of another effort that we actually continue to work on. And we'll get into it a, in a little more detail as far as the program it's emanating from. Um, but this property is called Cornerstone Village. Um, Cornerstone Village is part of a, a larger effort um, for choice neighborhoods a program that we have. And with this effort, what you're seeing are, um, it, well, and actually to help preface it, this is newer development that's located in the neighborhoods of Larimer and East Liberty. If you're familiar with <clears throat> those neighborhoods in the east end of Pittsburgh. Um, and let me see, uh, this project actually earned uh, several awards as well, like Sandstone Quarry. 
um, with the, you know, award from NARO, uh, it also earned an award of excellence related to um, not just design, but for this project, it was for community revitalization. And let's see, this, what you're seeing is actually um, phases one and two of what is going to be a four phase development. And it's more than just a development, it's actually a revitalization of a neighborhood. Um, and so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Let's go to the next slide. One of the ways we, as the Housing Authority, are able to um, you know, participate in efforts like this. And you might have, you might recall early on in the presentation, there was reference to um, historically the Housing Authority doing some traditional mixed finance development and then uh, getting involved in non-traditional. Uh, we're able to participate in activities like that through what you're seeing on the screen. The Housing Authority has an instrumentality called Allies and Ross Management and Development Corporation. Um, HUD allows the housing authority to essentially, housing authorities to essentially create a development arm. And this enables the housing authority to not just, you know, participate in having its traditional low income public housing redeveloped into mixed finance housing. Um, but Within that concept, it enables us to leverage public and private resources to transform communities um, and, and create these mixed income environments, which if you're unclear on what mixed income is, literally uh, the residents that may reside at that property may, uh, may have income that could fall into different categories. Some residents may be low income, um, there may be residents residing there that are actually market rate uh, units. Um, and the idea is, or they may be receiving some other assistance, but the idea is the property um, is one that is not just for low income. It's a blended community. Um, and the concept behind that is to not have low income persons live in um, isolation, but if you're in a more mixed environment, you have increased chances of improving your personal situation. <clears throat> okay, so. Thank you. So the earlier project that was displayed um, for Cornerstone Village is part of a uh, four phase effort that's emanating from the program you're seeing on this screen. It's called Choice Neighborhoods. Now this initiative, we're not only um, participating in related to that effort in Larimer and East Liberty for actual revitalization of a, a neighborhood, but um, on the right side of this slide, you'll see the Hill District mentioned. We um, are participating through Choice Neighborhoods in a planning effort that could very well culminate in a similar uh, uh, transformation of, of the neighborhood like we're currently involved in, in East Liberty. So for a program like this, it's a little different than traditional redevelopment where you know the housing authority may have an older property and want to redevelop. Um, this involves more than just housing authority property. It involves a, a larger partnership of the housing authority um, and many other partners that, I mean, there's so many to mention, but at least for Larimer East Liberty, for example, it involves the housing authority, the city of Pittsburgh, the urban redevelopment authority, the Pittsburgh public schools. It, it involves, um, I believe nonprofits uh, and, you know, there's a litany of resources, um, you know, local, you know, persons that may reside in that neighborhood, businesses and what have you. It's a huge program. And for the Larimer East Liberty, the Housing Authority led an, a competitive application process um, and, and did win a $30 million grant um, in order to spur the redevelopment in that area. Um, there are four phases. Um, 
at the end of it, you know, we'll, we anticipate having over 300 units. There is $120 million of ongoing investment for the housing component. Um, we've completed uh, two phases so far and phases three and four are gonna be occurring in 2021. That uh, property mentioned earlier, Cornerstone Village in that neighborhood, it is close to, if you know where like the target is, um, the East Busway, it, it's over in that part of the city. I wanna just say a couple of more items about the Choice Neighborhood Program. The Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, it, it is a grant. It, it's for neighborhood revitalization. Um, it is a program that is through HUD. It has three core goals, housing, which is to revi revitalize severely distressed public and or assisted housing, but it also has a people component. With that goal, it's for um, to provide support for positive outcomes for residents, for health, safety, employment, mobility, and education. And then the third goal is the neighborhood to transform distressed neighborhoods into viable mixed income neighborhoods with access to services, public assets, and amenities. Um, before we just go to the next slide, uh, with regard to the Hill District, the Housing Authority did uh, win a $500,000 grant for planning, um, and we did ac accomplish creating a choice neighborhood transformation plan, um, and that would pertain to the property we have in the Hill District. It's low-income public housing uh, called Bedford Dwellings. You might recall from earlier in the presentation, that was one of the first properties built by the Housing Authority when it was created. It is, uh, it's very old. It's like barrack style housing. housing. We are embarking on a, um, an effort to, whether we win another $30 million implementation grant or by other means, actually move forward on redeveloping. Um, not just the existing property that we own there, but in partnership with many other uh, entities similar to Larimer and East Liberty actually do some neighborhood rev revitalization in that area. If we can go to the next slide. Okay, now I mentioned in the beginning a little bit about the development and modernization department. This is just to also point out that um, the function of that department not only works with, you know, many outside entities um, and hiring, you know, for various services um, from vendors such as design and contractors and what have you. But we also do have an internal technical team that participates in the activities related to representing the housing authority when we're involved in these types of projects for development and modernization. Um, that team does, you know, provide some engineering, architectural design and what have you, um, services, um, you know, quality control. It's that in-house um, technical expertise that, that we perform for all the projects we're involved in. Um, if we can go to the next slide. We're gonna tr move on from the department that I work in because I can talk all day about that. Um, and let's talk about how how folks do business with the Housing Authority. So this involves, you know, the nature of procurement. The Housing Authority um, for, for doing business with us, you can see on this slide, the primary responsibilities that this function performs. Um, and now you can go to the next slide. Uh, the Housing Authority has the capability to engage with potential vendors through its website. Um, and, you know, we have a robust, you know, procurement system for all the goods and services that the agency is looking for. And normally what we do with vendors or prospective vendors is ask them essentially to register on the website. They can receive auto notifications um, and keep tabs on what's going on with projects um, from the time they're advertised to when they get awarded and, and what have you. Next slide, please. Um, this slide just goes into the various types of procurement that the agency does. Essentially though, all the goods and services that the housing authority acquires is done through competitive procurements for the most part. Um, and those goods and services can range to, I mean, anything you can think of that the housing authority may need for its properties, um, 
the construction that it does down to even office supplies. So this gets into various types of procurements um, given the regulatory rules we have to follow for how we acquire those services. Um, and part of that process also does in, include having special participation um, such as minority women-owned business, um, disadvantaged businesses, and even resident-owned businesses the Housing Authority will, will work with as well. I think that might sum that slide up. Let's uh, go to the next one. Oh, okay, I jumped in a little bit. With regard to the special participation, we have goals related to that that we try to achieve as well. So anytime we're doing business with somebody, you know, we look to if that vendor itself is not minority or women owned or what have you, that that effort they're going to participate in does include some participation from those entities as well. Next one. Okay, so now this is, you know, just displaying the large dollar value of efforts the Housing Authority has done where it had minority and women owned business participation. Next slide. Okay, so I think this is bringing us towards the end. Uh, we have some general contact information for various uh, areas of the Housing Authority. And yeah, and this, yeah, yeah, this is just the end now. So okay. uh, thank you, Sunshine. So I'll pop back and take back over. Yeah, so that's everything. That's the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh. I know we don't have tons of time, but if you have any questions, um, please ask us. And um, if Leah can also give you my contact info as well, if you have any questions um, in the future and want to reach out to me, um, and I can get, I'll put you in contact with um, and please follow us on social media at HCP1 on Twitter and at HCPGH on Facebook. Thank you so much, um, JP, Sunshine, and Anthony. That was a really great overview of the Housing Authority. Um, I think we have a couple questions in the chat, so why don't we try to get through some of those? Um, Larry? Thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, Sunshine spoke about some of the benefits of mixed income housing. Lots of research shows that there are huge benefits to mixing generations, deliberately including young families, lots of kids with seniors instead of segregating seniors. Do you focus on that at all? Um, do you want to take us on the sign or do you want me to? You can, you can, and then... I'll chime in if you need me to. Yeah, so I would say that in terms of building new housing for uh, senior residents, I don't know about any plans to be doing that. But what I'll say about why we have that specific housing set aside is because it's to make sure that those senior residents and people with disabilities don't fall through the, slip through the cracks and to make sure that, you know, the specific needs of senior residents and residents with disabilities are met, um, but that is a really um, important point that you're making, and that's why um, whenever we're moving forward, we are we do reevaluate what what uh, communities need redevelopment, what communities can be improved, because you know a building that was built in 1972 isn't the end all be all of the perfection of housing design. Um, so that's what I would say on that is that that's why they are currently concentrated. I don't know about any future plans. Sunshine, do you know about that? I don't, but if it helps at all, um, many of those elderly, you know, facilities may actually be located within a larger family community as well. So while the structure, the unit itself that they may live in may be with other seniors or disabled folks, they may be located within a community, a family community. And a lot of the, I believe, activities um, and, you know, experiences that they would have it may not be, you know, complete isolation as one might think. Yeah. If that and helps. Okay. North, North U Heights, to build off what she said, North U Heights is like the perfect example of that because it's not just actually North U Heights. I don't know if you've been to North U Heights, but it seems like it's one big community, but there's actually two communities. There's the family community and then right in the middle, there's the uh, North U Heights high rise. And actually most of the community events in that community, in that neighborhood in Northview Heights are either in the high rise or like right outside it. 
Um, so we do make an effort to make sure that our residents aren't isolated um, with, you know, for example, with um, COVID and recently we had movie nights to make sure that people could have like social things and stuff, but um, that's a good point. So thank you for, um, for, thank you for asking. That was a good question. Perfect, thank you. The, the second question is about policy. Uh, I've recently learned that market rate housing is governed by an antiquated state law that allows landlords to choose not to renew a tenant's lease for any reason or no reason. And that is frequently used uh, either as retaliation for filing complaints with the Department of Health or as a deterrent against filing complaints. I'm curious as to whether the same rule applies in housing authority units and whether or not it does if you think there's any way that Pittsburgh could uh, pass legislation that will le would level the playing field for tenants. So thanks for the question. For specifically for public housing, I can say that you know tenancy is governed by the lease agreement for all of our residents. Uh, we do biannual recertifications where residents have to provide updated income, re-verify their family composition and other uh, eligibility standards. Um, however, you know, with our process, lease termination is strictly kept for violations of the lease, non-payment of rent, um, or social infractions that would jeopardize the health and safety uh, of those living in the immediate community. Um, I would also say that in terms of uh, flexibility for Pittsburgh to like maybe change a definition of market rate or take action um, is that there's not necessarily a ton. So like I said, we are federally regulated, state regulated. Um, so there's only so much that as a local agency um, we can do. Uh, we are a moving to work agency, uh, which gives us more flexibility in terms of like service programming and things like that. But in terms of determining eligibility and like the definition of market rate and stuff, we don't have much flexibility on that. Now, the city, in theory, could take some legal action. Like, for example, the city, I believe, a couple years ago did pass a law to make it so landlords could not refuse a housing choice voucher. Uh, but just like that law, anything, any action by the city council would be subject to lawsuits and judicial review. And they, with the example that I just gave, that's where it's been. It's been in legal limbo. So really the solution for that kind of issue uh, would be at the larger levels, which um, is actually kind of something that you come across a lot when it comes to public housing authorities, not just in Pittsburgh, but across the country is because so much of the, the policy is set at the federal level. Uh, there's only so much that can be done locally. Understood, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ali? My internet went out, did we use the same my name? I know yes. my, my <laughs> name, great, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so it was really good to hear about some recent innovations and um, some of the technology, um, uh, you know, pr related programs, you know, available to, to residents. So th thank you for those. Um, within scattered and uh, with, within the, the focus on scattered and, and mixed income housing, though, it would seem that as um, communities are, are rebuilt, you know, with you know, for example, Allegheny dwellings on the, the north side, um, the availability of units uh, decreases, you know, during that transition. And then if I'm correct, you know, by the end, there will be a number of fewer units, right, than had been um, previous. And so I'm curious what this, the administration is doing. Doing to prioritize availability and access of, of units um, to the people who qualify. Um, so I if, I don't know if Anthony or Sunshine wants to jump in, but what I can say is uh, when we do 
redevelop or rehabilitate a community, the residents there are given the right of first return. So they are um, given to, they're guaranteed the right to return to a unit in the same community. And if they choose not to, we also pay um, to help. We also provide them with um, a stipend to find a new place to live. And we help, we also um, put them up while they are gone. So that is, uh, we have a whole counselor for it. We're doing a Manchester redevelopment. I was at, it was warm out still. So it was outside information session. A lot of people were asking questions. We have a specific person who works with residents um, to create their plan, and make sure that their concerns are met. But that is something that we, um, cause I mean, you know, with lots of history and dis the concerns about displacement, that's something that's on the front of a lot of people's minds. Um, and that's something that we do really make sure that everyone who wants to move back into the community can. And if they don't, or let's say they're not able to, we find them um, suitable replacement housing. Oh, Sunshine, do you have something to say? Uh, yes, and also given that there is a, a need for affordable housing in, our, in the city, uh, we do continue to build, not only through projects that the Housing Authority is doing, but we also, separately do partner with others who are building. So um, there are projects occurring that may have its own developer. And if not for partnering with us, uh, they may not be able to bring their project to fruition. At the end of the day, we housing authority may not actually own that property. Their developers are building new, um, but they may partner with us. And as part of what they're building, there may be, for example, they may agree to occupy some of their units uh, with vouchers that the housing authority may issue. I hope I'm explaining that right, Anthony. But overall, my perspective is the there is a big transformation occurring with regards to housing. Um, so where you know some of the older housing may be coming down and then new is coming up and it may be uh, mixed. Um, there are a lot of other activities that are happening as well. It's like morphing, but I, our trajectory right now, as far as what the housing authority is building is um, it's, it's unit quantities are increasing to fulfill a need, a need strategically over time. But what that housing looks like may just be different than traditional low-income public housing. Uh, I hope that helps. I think a good example of that sunshine would be the work happening over in Larmer and East Liberty right now. Um, while there has been some demolition and loss of units, there's been uh, new construction that's occurred. So you may not be going exactly to that portion of the community that you're in, uh, but we do have affordable units, uh, not just with our East Liberty scattered sites, but also uh, Larmer Place, uh, Cornerstone Village. So it it might not be that exact place, but there are additional opportunities being created in each of those those neighborhoods where folks are, uh, in some cases, temporarily displaced. Um, a lot of times with relocation, like JP mentioned, uh, we'd also have opportunities for residents to receive housing choice vouchers uh, so that they could rent with a private landlord if they wanted into that specific neighborhood. Thank you. Um, Darrell? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Hey, um, I, think you, I think you guys may have answered my, uh, most of my question. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I was just uh, wondering about the, um, you were saying earlier about, uh, about there being need for bids being placed for development in areas. Um, and I, I guess I was, my initial, I was wondering initially if that was the only way that um that the uh, the organization was planning on um, plans to like revise like communities for um, public housing um, yeah uh, the uh, I think I think you honestly I think you answered my question but um, I guess I was just trying to like figure it out myself 100 like you're trying to get um, it's not solely it's not solely devised by uh, by bids to try and determine which places to develop or not, right? That is that is correct. Right. Uh, there's a variety of mechanisms used to achieve that. Some are competitively procured, which can come in the form of the housing authority soliciting for a bid. Um, it could also come through the housing authority looking 
uh, procuring through requests for proposals. Um, everything is a competitive procurement per se, but the what's being procured can vary. It could be hiring vendors to perform a professional service or physical work, or it can be um, looking for, you know, for example, the what I mentioned a little bit ago, looking for developers who have projects they're trying to build that and they would be interested in partnering with us. Um, you know, in, in the one example where, you know, it, they may build their building, but um, at the end of the day, we, we don't have ownership interests, but through our partnership, we may provide vouchers, project-based vouchers so that tenants, their housing there, it provides an opportunity for the, our client base. Um, but uh, for the most part, everything is through a competitive procurement. The housing authority also does partner, uh, special, it may have special partnerships with local, local entities such as the city or, um, you know, other types of institutions. But for like goods and services, you know, construction, development, stuff like that, for the most part, everything is competitively procured when the housing authority is hiring directly. And let's say it already has a developer it's hired, that developer then may uh, do further on procurements itself if they need, you know, subs, so to speak. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Uh, thank you. All right, and I think we'll take our last question from Andrea. I just wanted to come back and thank you all for your presentations. But I have addressed privately to some of the speakers and I'd like to bring it to the public here on this format to the group of the uh, need of Try to consider the people who have what I call different abilities and having inclusion because what you have, what I have seen on the presentations is sometimes with the visual impairments I have difficult to see. And you have you know, talked about everything you're doing, going to a live stream or technology or Zoom, and this can be overwhelming for people who have different abilities to even get the information. So I would like to say that I hope in the future, and I made a joke about falling in between the cracks, that you still try to look for ways to get the information to other people that should be included because they are still seeking their goals and their needs to move met. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I didn't quite realize that's what you're, you meant when you mentioned me, but absolutely. And one of the things that we do, and, and I run the social media, is um, we do try to live stream uh, as many events as we can uh, to kind of broaden the accessibility uh, for that. But you're right, um, we can always do better. Uh, so that's something that we definitely will keep more uh, in mind moving forward that we include the differently abled, as you say, and make sure that, people, uh, that uh, we keep their needs in mind and that everything is as accessible to everyone as it would be to anyone else. And maybe you could offer some trainings for staff and other people to learn about the etiquette of doing these kind of presentations so things won't be so overwhelming. Because even in this presentation, I'm very sometimes it's very difficult to enter into a chat and little prints and find questions as, as you present your information. So you still have to have a certain timing and you still have to stay focused on the present information that you're given. So it can be overwhelming. So I would just ask that in the future that you have you know, some kind of training to staff and etiquette, and as you said, try to get better. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andrea. And if you're having issues with um, any of the CLA presentations, you can also feel free to reach out to me. We can try to brainstorm some solutions together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good night. All right, okay, I'm gonna give um, 
Anthony, JP, and Sunshine a clap reaction for their time tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if there are any outstanding questions, um, feel free to send them along to me and I can uh, work with the housing authority to get um, some answers. I can put those on Engage PGH. Um, so thanks everyone for sticking it out tonight. I think we are meeting next week. So finally we're on a weekly schedule for just a little bit. Um, I hope you all have a good night. Thank you.